Uh, good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to uh, today's ISU USI Smart Learning Program for the residents. Uh, viewers, today we have a very interesting topic, the topic which uh, you usually you don't uh, uh, pay attention to, uh, which is uh, very important. Not only is uh, it has some importance for theory exam, but as well as practical importance. You know, you will be doing so many endogeology procedures, so many open, so many oncology procedures, and there will be a lot of changes in the patient postoperatively. So, to make you apprise of uh, the various uh, hemodynamic changes in the form of patient base and electron imbalance, we have kept this uh, webinar today. And I am uh, uh, glad to introduce our uh, uh, the faculty for today's program, Dr. Sridhar from Bangalore, Dr. Divya from Mumbai, and Dr. A. Mohan from Bangalore. Uh, to begin with the webinar, may I invite the uh, present urology secretary, Dr. Sanjay Kulkarni, to say a few words as opening remarks, and then we'll start the program. Over to you, sir. Yeah. No, th thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Arun Chawla, for uh, this is very interesting topic. Oh, I'm happy to see Dr. A. Mohan, very close friend of mine, after some time, Dr. Sridhar and Dr. Divya Bajpai. So this is a fantastic combination. Uh, what about acid-base balance and this electrolyte disturbance? In 1977, I was the first year resident in surgery and my guru, Subhash Patki, um, uh, told me, because at that time we had a lot of patients with hyponatremia. So he gave me a formula of 0.3 WD. 0.3 into weight in kg plus difference. So suppose normal potassium should be one, normal sodium should be 135. Then if it is 120, the difference and you replace it over a period of time. So this was told to me and I followed it over a period of time. I just want to refresh my memories whether I'm still doing the correct thing or not. So this is a very important topic in today's complex patient that we treat in urology. Basically those who uh, have undergone major surgery and who are transferred to ICU. So thank you everyone for participating and I'm very pleased to see my friend Dr. A. Mohan. Thank you. Yeah, thank you Sanjay for those nice words and uh, Dr. Sridhar too is an old friend. We'll be meeting Dr. Bajpayee for the first time. Um, you're right. Let's learn. Correct. Thank you. Should I start, sir? Yeah, I, I think yeah, I, uh, sir, uh, yeah, I was having a uh, little problem with my laptop. Yeah, so it's uh, indeed uh, a privilege to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Sridhar Rajana. Uh, and uh, his presentation will be followed by uh, Dr. Divya. And after the event, Dr. A. Mohan will be giving the precise summary and the expert comments and the carry home message, which residents should uh, be a little proactive and listening to. Uh, Dr. Sridhar Rajana is uh, a formerly associate professor of uh, Institute of Nephrology, Bangalore, and now he is a consultant at Fortis Hospital, uh, Bangalore. He is a nephrologist and intensivist and has many publications and presentation to his credit. Uh, uh, with this brief introduction, it's over to you, Dr. Sidhar, for your presentation. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Good evening sir. Good evening, uh, USI, uh, uh, so, you know, personnel and uh, students. Uh, I'm going to uh, share the screen and uh, hopefully you'll be able to, just one second. Okay. Um, you can all get the, you see the screen now? Yes, we can. Oh. Yeah, we can. Okay. So good evening, one and all. And uh, I'll just, uh, uh, you know, uh, like Sir said, uh, acid base and electrolytes are very, very critical in the management of uh, extremely sick patients. And I hope to introduce you to my method of uh, analyzing uh, arterial uh, uh, blood gases. 
So in order to do so, we must have a solid foundation of acid-based physiology and pathology. Only when you know the physiology and pathology, you will be able to uh, analyze an ABG and uh, provide proper uh, appropriate treatment. And in doing so, I'll just go through some basic uh, fundamentals of uh, you know physiology and then pathology, and then uh, introduce you to clinical cases using the approach of ABG analysis. Now, uh, sorry, the screen is not moving. Uh, There is some issue here, I think. Okay. Uh, okay, so hydrogen ion concentration, free form of the hydrogen ion concentration. pH is nothing but negative logarithm of hydrogen in uh, moles per liter. For example, in the extracellular fluid, pH is 7.40, free hydrogen ion concentration is 40. And this is what we do when I do an ABG. We are checking the pH in the extracellular fluid. That is, we are measuring hydrogen ion concentration of 40 nanomoles per liter. Whereas in the intracellular fluid, the pH is 7.10, which corresponds to a hydrogen concentration of 80 to 100. In urine, pH can be as low as 5, which corresponds to hydrogen ion concentration of 10,000. And in gastric fluid, pH is uh, as low as 2, which corresponds to 70 million nanomoles of hydrogen ion concentration. So you can see there is a huge difference in the hydrogen ion concentration in various body compartments. And maintaining this balance is very critical in the acid-base uh, analysis. Now, pH, why is it so important? Because a very narrow range of pH in the extracellular fluid between 7.36 and 7.44 is essential for normal physiology and normal cellular metabolism and function. Extreme ranges of pH that is less than 7.2 or greater than 7.55 are life-threatening. So you see that small changes in hydrogen ion concentration lead to huge changes in pH and therefore hydrogen ion concentration has to be very, very tightly controlled and that is where acid-base balance comes into play. Every day, the human body produces about 15,000 millimoles of carbon dioxide by the metabolism of carbohydrates and fats. And this carbon dioxide, when combining it with water, produces carbonic acid, which is a weak acid. This is carbon dioxide is removed by respiration, and therefore it is called a volatile acid. Whereas in a normal Western diet, about one milliequivalent per kg of non-volatile acids are also produced which is, for example, sulfur-containing amino acid metabolism or phosphorus-containing amino acid metabolism. So this leads to the generation of non-carbonic acids such as sulfuric acid or phosphoric acid, etc. And these non-volatile acids are effectively removed by the kidney. So therefore, every day, about 15,070 millimoles of acid is produced and this has to be removed. Otherwise, what will happen is, forget about the calculations, take it from me that when you add these 15,070 millimoles of hydrogen, pH will drop from 7.40 to 0 0.45, which is, as you know, is fatal. That is, life cannot exist at a pH of 7.45. So therefore, in the body, there is constantly this process of buffering. Buffering means it is like a sponge. It just takes the water away from the surface or if you compress the sponge, water can come out of the sponge. So that is buffering. So buffers are chemical systems that either accept or release hydrogen so that the changes in free hydrogen ion concentration are minimized. That means although buffers do not remove hydrogen or alkali from the body, by minimizing the changes in free hydrogen ion concentration, wide fluctuations in the pH are avoided and that strict maintenance of pH is important for the normal cellular functions of the body. So I will give you an illustration of the buffer system. For it, let us assume that 10 millimoles of keto acids are produced in a diabetic patient who is not taking insulin. So if you add 10 millimoles per liter of 
beta hydroxy butyric acid that is a ketone body if you add that uh, to a ph of 7.40 without buffering the ph will drop to less than 2 which is fatal so what happens in the body there is instantaneous buffering as soon as the acid is added to the body uh, because of uh, non metabolism of the glucose bicarbonate is used up in buffering that acid so when you add 10 millimoles of keto acid bicarbonate will 10 millimoles of bicarbonate is used up therefore bicarbonate uh, concentration drops from 24 which is normal to 14 and in doing so the ph only drops from 7.4 to 7.32 which is still within the physiological range so therefore you can see even though I added 10 millimoles of acid, which would have made the pH less than 2 without buffering, because of buffering, pH is only 7.32. And when we analyze an ABG, this is what we are trying to see. What has happened that made the changes in the pH, which I will use this, uh, you know, subsequently I will come through cases for this. So now what are the various buffer systems in the body? Carbon dioxide bicarbonate buffer system, which I just explained, is the most important buffer system. And inorganic uh, in the extracellular fluid specifically, inorganic phosphates, plasma proteins, etc. In the intracellular compartment, proteins, uh, phosphates, hemoglobin, and bone are also buffer systems. So, but we will be today, in order to analyze ABG, we are only going to utilize the carbon dioxide bicarbonate buffer system. So by analyzing the carbon dioxide bicarbonate buffer system, we can deduct, deduce what has happened in the body to make these changes. So uh, forget about the calculation. You don't have to worry about it. This is the uh, fundamental uh, equation that uh, is used called the henderson hasselbalch equation. Uh, hydrogen ion concentration is equal to 24 into PaCO2 divided by bicarbonate. And the ultimate pH of in the body, therefore, will depend on the amount of acid that is produced, buffering capacity of the body, and the rate of excretion by lungs and kidneys. So, all these three processes together determine what is the pH in, in the extracellular fluid, in the intracellular fluid, so on and so forth. And a tight control of this is essential for normal cellular functioning. So, kidneys play an important role in regulating systemic bicarbonate, which is the metabolic component of the acid-base balance. Kidneys reclaim all filtered bicarbonate in the urine. That is, 4,000 millimoles of bicarbonate is filtered every day in the kidney, in a normal kidney. The entire bicarbonate is reclaimed in the kidney. In addition, there is a new bicarbonate that is generated in the kidney, which is about 70 milliequivalents. I told you that is the non-volatile acid that is produced in the body and this is also, also called net acid excretion by the kidney. So kidneys reclaim entire filtered load of bicarbonate and in addition regenerate new bicarbonate to compensate for the non-volatile acids that is produced by the metabolism of non uh, of uh, amino acids. So acid-base balance I have already mentioned is essential for normal cellular functioning and arterial pH is maintained within a very narrow range of 7.36 to 7.44. And this is this happens because of the adaptation by blood buffers, which happen instantaneously. Lungs, which happens within uh, you know, 1 to 15 minutes. And kidneys, which take about 3 to 5 days for maximal adaptation. So with this basic background about the pH and the hydrogen ion concentration, so on and so forth, let us see the interpretation, ABG analysis and interpretation. So this is an ABG printout. In the ABG printout, PCO2, that is partial pressure of carbon dioxide, PO2, oxygen, partial pressure of oxygen, and pH are measured parameters. Whereas bicarbonate in the uh, ABG is a calculated parameter, calculated based on the henderson hasselbalch equation that I previously shared with you. Now, why should we learn ABG? Because I have already mentioned the changes in the bicarbonate carbon dioxide buffer system, that is the ABG, provides information on the physiological processes that maintain pH homeostasis, and it plays a pivotal role in the diagnosis 
and management of critically ill patients. Therefore, proper evaluation of ABG is imperative even for urology residents and for every patient, every doctor who deals with critically ill patients, proper evaluation of ABG is essential. And let us try to understand how to proceed from now on. So in analyzing an ABG, please note the moment a pH is less than 7.35, don't call it as acidosis. It is a state, call it as acidemia. And when the pH is greater than 7.45, it is alkalemia. Whereas acidosis is a process, not a state. It is a process which tends to acidify body fluids, that is lower plasma bicarbonate, and if in opposed, if unopposed, will lead to a fall in pH. So acidosis will ultimately lead to acidemia. But if you just look at pH of 7.20, don't call it as acidosis. If you only have one parameter, pH 7.20, it is acidemic, whereas alkalosis is a process which tends to alkalinize body fluids, that is rise bicarbonate, and if unopposed, will lead to a rise in pH. So if you see a pH of 7.58, call it as alkalemic with, if you have only one parameter. In addition, metabolic is a term that refers to a primary alteration in hydrogen or bicarbonate, whereas Respiratory refers to results from a primary alteration in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide due to altered carbon dioxide elimination by the lungs. So these are all the terminologies that we keep using in ABG anal analysis. So let us go to metabolic acidosis. In metabolic acidosis, there is acid load, that is free hydrogen load. So what happens when you have free hydrogen load? there is instantaneous extracellular buffering by the bicarbonate that is present in the blood. Subsequently, within minutes, the lung starts to increase the tidal volume or rate and hence lower PCO2. So this tries to balance the change in pH that would have otherwise happened. So this decrease in PCO2 is part and parcel of the metabolic acidosis process. And over the next few hours, there is intracellular and bone buffering. And over hours to days, there is increased renal hydrogen ion excretion. That is, net acid excretion is increased by the kidney. So this is the sequential response of the body to a hydrogen load. And the primary defect in metabolic acidosis is a decrease in bicarbonate. Causes of metabolic acidosis can be acid gain, such as lactic acid, whenever there is hypotension, lactic acidosis, sepsis, lactic acidosis, or keto acids are added, such as di diabetic ketoacidosis or starvation ketosis, D-lactic acidosis, or intoxicants such as methanol, ethylene glycol, etc. And of course, in renal failure, also there is metabolic acidosis. So these are the causes of acid gain leading to metabolic acidosis, whereas loss of bicarbonate is also cause of metabolic acidosis. Uh, which can happen through the GI tract or loss in urine or renal tuberous acidosis. So these are all causes of metabolic acidosis. And when we are analyzing ABG, we also look at a concept called anion gap. So this is how anion gap is calculated. Sodium minus chloride and bicarbonate. So if you see here, sodium is 140. There are other unmeasured cations such as potassium, magnesium, calcium, etc. Whereas on the uh, anion side, there is chloride, there is bicarbonate and uh, proteins, sulfates, organic acids, etc. So the difference between the unmeasured cation and unmeasured anion is called the anion gap, which is normally 12. When you add 10 millimoles of organic acid that I showed in that buffering illustration, 10 millivolts of bicarbonate will be used up. Therefore, the bicarbonate level drops to 14 and there is unmeasured cation, anion increases. Therefore, the gap becomes 22. So that means anion gap has increased from a normal level of 12 to an enhanced level of 22. The change in anion gap is 10, 22 minus 12, 10. That is called delta gap. So in metabolic acidosis, there is a decrease in bicarbonate, 
uh, that is the initial change and there is decrease in pco2 which is a compensatory change in metabolic alkalosis primary change is a rise in bicarbonate the compensatory change is a rise in pco2 because of hypoventilation that is induced by the alkalinizing ph in the brain so what are the causes of metabolic alkalosis common causes are vomiting diuretic use excess diuretic use hypokalemia and increased aldosterone activity these are common causes of metabolic alkalosis whereas rare causes include hypercalcemia milk alkali syndrome gentleman syndrome barter etc you don't have to worry about it just remember whenever there is volume depletion vomiting diuretic use or hypokalemia you can expect metabolic alkalosis so how about respiratory disorders whenever there is an increase in pco2 because of hypoventilation due to various causes instantaneously you know within minutes there is intracellular buffering and within hours to days 3 to 5 days there is increased renal hydrogen excretion which tends to bring the ph back to a normal that is what happens in respiratory acidosis that is increase in pco2 whereas in respiratory alkalosis there is a decrease in pco2 which is the primary change and the decrease in bicarbonate is the compensatory change so this is this slide shows pattern of changes in acid base disorders please note that the initial or primary change and the compensatory change happen always in the same direction that is the first dictum of abg primary change and compensatory change always happen in the same direction if it does not then there is a mixed disorder now i use this approach called boston approach to also called the physiological approach to the evaluation of acid base disorder there is also a base excess or the copenhagen approach and there is also a strong ion or stewart approach i find the boston approach is the most physiological and most accurate and everybody can decipher or analyze every complex abg using this method in the boston approach obviously in any medical uh, uh, you know scenario you have to have comprehensive history and physical examination then you have to evaluate simultaneously performed abg and electrolytes third step is identification of the dominant disorder that is where i am going to continue identification of the dominant disorder so if you have an abg how do you identify the dominant disorder fourth step is calculation of compensation i will describe in detail and fifth step is calculation of anion gap and the delta gaps so let us go to step 3 identification of the dominant disorder let us say arterial ph if it is decreased you call it as acidemia if it is increased you call it as alkalemia sub further if bicarbonate is decreased that is ph is decreased bicarbonate is also decreased so that will be metabolic acidosis so when <coughs> ph is low bicarbonate is low dominant disorder is metabolic acidosis whereas when ph is low but pco2 is high dominant disorder is respiratory acidosis on the other hand when ph is high that is alkalemia if bicarbonate is also high it is metabolic alkalosis if the pco2 is low it is respiratory alkalosis so you can see here when ph and primary parameter are in the same direction for example decrease decrease increase and increase it is a metabolic problem whereas when ph and the primary change are in the opposite direction it is a respiratory problem so the first dictum was primary and compensatory change happen in the same direction always the second dictum is if ph is in the opposite direction of the primary change it is a meta, uh, respiratory problem if ph and primary change are in the same direction it is a metabolic problem so the fourth step is calculation of the gaps uh so rather sorry if the compens uh, calculation of compensation that is if the bicarbonate decreases by this much what should be the compensatory change and that is given in this whole body 
response equations. This is a little complicated, but it is actually, if you keep using it, it is very, very simple. Uh, I will actually go to the next slide, wherein I have made it simple. In metabolic acidosis, the change in PCO2 will be equal to 1.2 times the change in bicarbonate. That is what it says. Change in PCO2 is equal to 1.2 times change in bicarbonate. Whereas in respirate metabolic alkalosis, the compensation factor is 0 0.7. In respiratory disorders, acidosis compensation factor is 0 0.1 if it is acute because kidney takes three to five days, there is an acute and a chronic variant. And in chronic, the uh, compensation factor is 0 0.3. Whereas in alkalosis, it is 0 0.2 and 0 0.5. So these are whole body response equations. Acidosis, metabolic acidosis has a higher compensation factor. In respiratory, alkalosis has higher compensation factors. So 1.2, 0 0.7, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.5. The lower set for acute, higher set for chronic. So if you remember this, you can solve every acid-based problem in the world accurately, whether you are a psychiatry resident or if you are a nephrology uh, professor, you can accurately analyze the ABG. So last step is calculation of gaps. That is anion gap I have already mentioned. Sodium minus chloride and bicarbonate normally is 12. Delta anion gap is anion gap minus 12. And delta bicarbonate is 24, which is normal of bicarbonate mi minus whatever bicarbonate that you get in the patient. So if you add the delta bicarbonate to the bicarbonate that you delta anion gap to the existing bicarbonate, you will get what we call as pre-existing bicarbonate level that would have been present if anion gap acidosis did not occur. That's a hypothetical you know, calculation. That's how you make it. Anyway, I will use this approach when we go through the case scenarios. So uh, the common uh, acid-base scenarios that we normally face, that you normally face, renal failure, you get metabolic acidosis. Vomiting, I have already told you, metabolic alkalosis. Diarrhea leads to metabolic acidosis because of loss of bicarbonate in the stool. Cirrhosis leads to respiratory alkalosis. Hypotension leads to lactic acidosis, which is metabolic acidosis. COPD, respiratory acidosis. Sepsis can lead to both respiratory alkalosis due to the uh, stimulation of the respiratory zone in the brain, as well as metabolic acidosis due to lactic acid accumulation. Pulmonary embolism leads to respiratory alkalosis. Pregnancy leads to respiratory alkalosis and diuretic use, I told you, volume depletion, metabolic alkalosis. Most common clinical scenarios are given here. So now, how we can approach using this uh, method, how to analyze uh, case scenarios that I will go through in the subsequent slides. Case one is a 15-year-old juvenile diabetic patient who presents with abdominal pain, vomiting and fever and tiredness for one day. He stopped taking insulin three days ago. It's a type one diabetic patient, stopped taking insulin. Examination revealed tachycardia, blood pressure is 100 by 60, and he was dehydrated. Abdominal examination was normal. The ABG shows pH of 7.31, PCO2 is 26, uh, bicarbonate is 12, and sodium 140, potassium 5, and chloride 100. So evaluate the acid-based disorder. So it's a common presentation. Type one diabetic patients, stops insulin, comes with vomiting, what looks like diabetic ketoacidosis, but we have to actually prove that it is uh, metabolic acidosis. So now, this is the boxed uh, values or what is given. pH is low, PCO2 is low, bicarbonate is low. I already told you, if primary and secondary will always go in the same direction, but if the pH is also in the same direction, here all are low, pH low, PCO2 low, bicarb low. So therefore, dominant disorder is metabolic acidosis. And the compensation factor in metabolic acidosis is 1.2. That means delta PCO2 is equal to 1.2 times delta bicarbonate, which leads to a value of 14. And therefore, PCO2 is 40 minus 14, which is 26. And in this patient, the PCO2 is exactly 26. That means this is compensated metabolic acidosis which is confirmed, which is consistent with the history. However, we must also go through step five, which is calculation of the gaps. Here, anion gap is sodium 140, 
minus chloride which is 100 minus bicarbonate which is 12. That means anion gap is 140 minus 100 plus 12 which is 28 which is very high. Diabetic ketoacidosis is a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Yes. Therefore, we are again confirming high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Then we have to calculate the delta gap. Delta gap is 28, which is the anion gap. Normal is 12. It becomes 16. So if you add the 16 to the existing bicarbonate, that means 16 plus existing bicarbonate is 12, becomes 28. So if this anion gap producing acidosis were not to happen, patient's bicarbonate would have been 28. When do you get 28 bicarbonate? It must be either metabolic alkalosis or respiratory acidosis. Obviously, in this case, respiratory acidosis is ruled out because PSCO2 is appropriately compensated. So therefore, I can make a diagnosis of high anion gap metabolic acidosis plus metabolic alkalosis. And metabolic alkalosis here is because of vomiting and the patient was already dehydrated. We know BP was low. So therefore, I am making a diagnosis of high anion gap metabolic acidosis and metabolic alkalosis. The advantage of making the diagnosis of metabolic alkalosis is I know that I have to replace this patient with fluid, which is preferably normal saline. If metabolic alkalosis was not to be present, I can be just giving insulin more and instead of uh, you know flooding the patient with normal saline. But here, I know that I have to give normal saline as well. So by approaching the physio by using the physiologic Boston approach, I am able to appropriately analyze this ABG and come to this conclusion. So let us go to case two. He's a 24 year old boy who presents with continuous vomiting of three day duration, mental confusion, giddiness and tiredness. Examination reveals tachycardia, hypotension and dehydration, almost similar to the previous case, except that this patient is not diabetic. pH is 7.50. PCO2 is 48 and bicarbonate is 32. What is the acid base disorder here? So here we have pH is high, PCO2 is high, bicarbonate is high. That means pH and primary compensatory changes are in the same direction. Therefore, this is metabolic. It is high. Therefore, it is alkalosis. So the dominant disorder here is metabolic alkalosis. And the compensation factor for metabolic alkalosis is 0 0.7. So therefore, PCO2 is equal to delta PCO2 is equal to 0 0.7 times delta bicarbonate. Normal bicarbonate is 24. Here it is 32. Therefore, delta is 8. So I get a figure of 5.6. Rounding it out, I make it a 6. So therefore, PACO2 should be 46, which is here it is 48, which means uh, one or two we take as uh, that is close enough. So I am making a diagnosis here of compensated metabolic alkalosis. But again, I have to go to step four, which is calculation of the gap. Anion gap is 22. I cannot get a metabolic alkalosis with anion gap of 22. That means there must be metabolic acidosis as well. So I am making a diagnosis of high anion gap metabolic acidosis in addition to metabolic alkalosis. Maybe the metabolic acidosis is due to lactic acidosis because the patient was hypotensive in shock. So I am making a diagnosis of metabolic alkalosis. That means patient requires normal saline volume replacement. I'm also making a diagnosis of metabolic acidosis. So I have to look for ketoacidosis or lactic acidosis or intoxicants. So those are, that is the value of making a diagnosis of high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Then I have to go through the differential and try to see. Then I may do a blood culture in this patient. I may give broad spectrum antibiotics. I may look if the patient is diabetic. I may look for ketone bodies, so on and so forth. So by appropriately analyzing the ABG, I am. it helps me to go to the next step, how to manage the patient. I hope you're following this because I know it is a little complicated when you're uh, you know, hearing for the first time or when you have not applied. But if you keep applying all these calculations, you can do in your mind. You don't even need to put it in paper. Uh, look at the ABG and within, you know, in, uh, in almost instantaneously, you will come up with the diagnosis. So next case is going to be a 50-year-old uh, man present with a history of progressive dyspnea and wheezing for four days. He had fever, cough, and yellowish sputum, sleepiness for one day. His, uh, he was tachypneic, pulse was 100 and bounding, BP was 160 by 96, cyanosis was seen, patient was drowsy with asterixis, 
and extensive wheezing was noted on auscultation. Chest X-ray showed hyperinflated lung fields with a tubular heart. So the history is giving me a pointer towards COPD. That's what I am expecting. ABG shows pH of 7.30 low, PCO2 is 60 high, bicarbonate is 28 high. So pH is in the opposite direction of the primary and compensatory changes. Therefore, this is a respiratory disorder. pH is low. Therefore, this is respiratory acidosis. So dominant disorder is respiratory acidosis. In this case, it is chronic because it has been going on for several days. I take a chronic compensation factor for respiratory acidosis, which is 0 0.3. Therefore, delta bicarbonate is equal to 0 0.3 times delta PCO2. That means 0 0.3 into 20. 20 is nothing but 60, which is the PCO2 in this patient, minus normal PCO2 40, which is 20. I'm getting a value of 6. Therefore, bicarbonate should be 24 plus 6, which is 30. So here, bicarbonate is 28. Again, within 2, I take it as appropriate. So I'm making a diagnosis of compensated chronic respiratory acidosis. I'm making the diagnosis in this patient. And anion gap is 10, which is normal. So therefore, it is a single disorder here. Please remember, in most clinical scenarios, you will actually see double or even triple acid-based disorders. Simple single acid-based disorder is actually somewhat rare. So anyway, I'm giving this example of a res chronic respiratory acidosis, which is compensated appropriately. So the exact you know, technical term will be compensated chronic respiratory acidosis is the correct uh, interpretation of this case. And next case is a 20-year-old girl presents with complaints of difficulty in breathing and upper abdominal discomfort for the past one hour. Please note, one hour. So I'm going with acute. On examination, vitals are normal. Patient is hyperventilating, otherwise normal. pH is 7.50 high. PCO2 is 25 low. Bicarbonate is 21 low. pH is in the opposite direction of the primary change. Hence, I'm making it as a respiratory disorder and pH is high. Hence, it is respiratory alkalosis. History is for one hour. I make it as an acute respiratory alkalosis. And the compensation factor for acute respiratory alkalosis is 0 0.2. Therefore, delta bicarbonate is equal to 0 0.2 into delta PCO2, which is 0 0.2 into 15. That is 40 minus 25 is 15, which is 3. Therefore, bicarbonate should be 24 minus 3, which is 21, exactly what is in this patient. So I am making a diagnosis of compensated acute respiratory alkalosis. Please note, in acute respiratory alkalosis or respiratory alkalosis per se, anion gap can be slightly elevated up to 16. We take it as appropriate in this situation. So I'm not going to <coughs> give this patient a metabolic acidosis, but I'm going to say respiratory alkalosis is the disorder here. So now uh, I'm going to just tell about a very common patient that we see in nephrology uh, world. Uh, explain the acid-based disorder of a 35-year-old man with history of CKD, treated with high dose of diuretics, admitted to hospital with pneumonia. So you will agree with me, this is a common scenario. CKD patient on, you know, Fusinex 100 mg BD or Ditor uh, 40 mg BD, comes to hospital with uh, pneumonia, very common case. pH is 7.52, high. PCO2 is 30, low. Bicarbonate is 21, low. So that is a respiratory alkalosis. pH is high, but PCO2 and bicarbonate are low. So the patient has history, I have not given you how many days, but let us say this patient has, uh, I'll take the acute component because I don't know the duration. Dominant disorder is respiratory alkalosis. Delta PCO bicarbonate, therefore, should be 0.2 times delta PCO2. Here, PCO2 is 30, therefore, delta PCO2 is 10. 0.2 times 10 is 2. Therefore, this patient's bicarbonate should be 24 minus 2, which is 22, which is exactly what we have. So, this is compensated acute respiratory alkalosis. However, I have to do step 4, which is calculation of the gaps. Or rather, compensation is appropriate. I have done step four. Now I have to go to step five, which is calculation of the gaps. Anion gap is 26. I told you respiratory alkalosis can have a slight high anion gap, but not 26. So when you have 26 anion gap, 
you make a diagnosis of metabolic acidosis high iron gap because uh, then you have to look for causes that is sepsis lactic acidosis or ketoacidosis in a diabetic patient or intoxicants so anion gap is uh, 26 therefore it is high anion gap metabolic acidosis delta anion gap is 14 26 minus 12 is 14 if you add this 14 to the existing bicarbonate of 21 you get a pre-existing bicarbonate of 35 that means if this anion gap producing acidosis did not occur, bicarbonate would have been 35. Why? Because we are giving high dose of diuretics to this patient. So therefore, I am making a diagnosis, a third disorder. I am making a diagnosis of respiratory alkalosis plus high anion gap metabolic acidosis plus metabolic alkalosis. So metabolic alkalosis tells me I have to cut back on the diuretics. Metabolic acidosis, high anion gap tells me I have to look for sepsis. And respiratory alkalosis is there again due to pneumonia. So you see that a common patient who is admitted in the nephrology ward has a triple acid base disorder and I am able to solve this appropriately using the Boston approach which you cannot do with the base excess approach or the Stewart's strong, uh, strong iron uh, approach. So uh, I'm going to uh, just uh, uh, two more cases I have. I think uh, I have uh, four minutes. I will try to finish by that time. So uh, this is a case that you will see. You have done uh, for a 21-year-old male with progressive renal insufficiency. He had congenital obstructive uropathy and he had an ideal loop for diversion that was created a while ago. Here the patient uh, has a pH of 7.20 low. PCO2 is 24 low, bicarbonate is 10 low. All are low, same direction, metabolic acidosis is the dominant disorder. Compensation factor for metabolic acidosis is 1.2. Therefore, PACO2 is equal to 1.2 into delta bicarbonate. That is 1.2 into 14, which is about 17. Therefore, PACO2 should be 40 minus 17, 23. Here it is 24. So therefore, I'm making... This is a compensated metabolic acidosis. However, anion gap is 20, which is high anion gap metabolic acidosis. But when I look at the delta gap, I get a delta gap of 8. 20 minus 12 is 8. When I add 8 to the existing bicarbonate of 10, I'm only getting a bicarbonate of 18. That means even if this high anion gap metabolic acidosis was not present, bicarbonate would have been only 18. Only two disorders can give bicarbonate of 18, metabolic acidosis or respiratory alkalosis. And this patient's PACO2 is appropriate for the level of bicarbonate. Therefore, I cannot make a diagnosis of al respiratory alkalosis. Therefore, this bicarbonate was low even beforehand that is suggestive of a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, so-called mixed metabolic acidosis. That is presence of high anion gap metabolic acidosis due to maybe sepsis and or renal failure and normal anion gap metabolic acidosis due to the ileal loop diversion. So patients with ileal loop diversions can have normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. So does patients with renal tubular acidosis or, uh, you know, uh, diarrhea also. So patients in this kind of situation uh, have mixed metabolic acidosis and I'm able to do this Di double diagnosis here because I go through all five steps. Okay. So finally, I just want to illustrate one case wherein how you use ABG to manage a patient on respirator, ventilator. A 55 year old female with diabetic nephropathy was admitted to hospital with left ventricular failure, had hyperkalemia, STT changes and troponin were increased. Hemodialysis was initiated. Uh, she had an angiogram, coronary angiogram, which was normal. She was about to be discharged when she developed sudden cardiopulmonary arrest and was uh, resuscitated and put on a ventilator and transferred to ICU on the ventilator at 1 p.m. So look at the ABG at 1 p.m. pH is 6.99. PCO2 was 40, is 49 and bicarbonate is 12. Base excess minus 20. I did not touch on base excess, but let us uh, take it for granted that a lower base excess indicates a metabolic acidosis. So it is minus 20. So what should I do now? Whenever pH is less than 7.10, don't worry about the analysis of the ABG. Immediately give sodium bicarbonate IV. 
because we want to bring the pH to about 7.1. So here I gave three ampules of sodium bicarbonate IV. One hour later, 2 p.m., repeat ABG shows pH is 7.24. I told you I want the pH more than 7.1. I have achieved that. Now the PCO2 is 33. It was 49 before. Now it is 33. Bicarbonate is, is 14. Base excess is minus 20. So if you look at the pH is down, bicarb is down, PCO2 is down. That means it is metabolic acidosis. And in metabolic acidosis, when you have a bicarbonate of 14, that is delta is 10, PCO2 should be 1.2 times 10, that is 12 is the delta, PCO2 should be 28. So this PCO2 is too high for this bicarbonate. Because the patient is a ventilator, she is not able to correct by herself. So we have to change the ventilator setting to increase the tidal volume, either rate or uh, uh, minute ventilation, we have to increase the minute ventilation by increasing rate or tidal volume. So I increase tidal volume in this patient. Six o'clock, pH is 7.52, PCO2 is now 17, and bicarb is still 13, base excess has improved. What should I do? Now, I told you for a bicarb of 14, pH, uh, PCO2 should have been 28. For a bicarb of 13, PCO2 should have been 27 or 26, but here it is 17. That means I am now overventilating. So now I want to decrease the minute ventilation. I decrease the rate in this patient. And again, one uh, two hours later, pH is again almost the same. Bicarbonate PSCO2 is slightly high, 20. Bicarbonate is 16. Uh, uh, base excess is better. Still, there is too much of overcompensation that I am doing in the ventilator. So now I change the patient from SIMV rather a CMV to SIMV. That means by analyzing sequential ABG, we are appropriately managing the ventilator in a patient who is in the ICU. And this is what we do in our ICUs day in and day out. Look at the ABG sequentially and see what changes need to be done. Without that, you will not be making, you may not be making appropriate changes. So I'm going to stop here, thanking you for this opportunity and leaving you with just this one slide. If you remember this, I request you to get a printout of this step four, keep it in your pockets. And whenever you see the ABG, apply this compensation, go through steps, uh, you know, three, four, five, and you will be, I can guarantee you whether you are a, like I said, psychiatry resident or a urology resident, you will make the exact same diagnosis as a accomplished nephrologist also. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sridhar. I would like, for the sake of urologists, for some of whom a few things might be new, to sum up as follows. The first thing to remember here is that there is an ECF and there is an ICF. The intracellular and the extracellular components, which behave differently when it comes to buffering, in terms of time taken for the buffering to take place. The second important thing to remember is that there is a link between electrolytes and blood gases. We are so often used to looking only at electrolytes without looking at blood gases. And to manage a patient well metabolically, we need to look at both. There are compensatory mechanisms, and it is for us, however, to remember all the time that these mechanisms take time. Some of them happen quickly, some of them take time. And therefore, we can't sit back when we notice that there is an acid-based problem, an electrolyte problem, and expect that the body will take care of itself. Like we often say in surgery, healing will take care of everything. In this case, healing might not take care of everything because healing takes time. So this is time limited. As surgeons, it is important for us to remember that the patient might be on informal medication of which we know nothing. So these medications could be adding acid, could be adding alkali. So if there is something inexplicable in our analysis, it's good to go back and see where the contribution to the difference is coming. I'm glad Dr. Sridhar took us back to our basic mathematics of high school uh, he introduced us to logarithms at the beginning and then went on to calculus in delta calculation. I'm happy that some of it will come back to us. But these calculations are the key to managing acid base and blood gas differences effectively. 
The contribution of tissue injury from surgeons should not be underestimated because sometimes this can be unpredictable. There is no formula to say this much tissue injury causes this much acidosis or releases this much potassium or causes this much consumption of bicarbonate. So keep it to a minimum, make sure the tissue injury is not contributing. So to sepsis. For those of us who are very annoyed with anesthetists, but why they make such a fuss about ABG and electrolytes and so on before surgery, okay. you saw the last few slides where ventilation can make things worse. At the same time, properly ventilated patients can remain healthy throughout the anesthetic procedure and come out the same. Urinary diversion, of course, is another ball game. It's been taken up earlier. It will be taken up again. And with this, I'm extremely grateful to Dr. Sridhar for bringing this out. And I hope, like he said, this slide will be in your pockets when you deal with patients. Thank you, Dr. Sridhar. And Dr. Arun, back to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sridhar, excellent presentation. I think uh, <clears throat> you have, with example, you have made... Uh, the whole topic so simple. And for the residents, Dr. Sridhar has handed over the slide to us. And uh, at the end of presentation, we will put in the, uh, the residents group, both the MCH and the DNV groups. And um, with this, now I'll invite our uh, second faculty, Dr. Divya Vajpayee. Uh, Dr. Divya Vajpayee is Professor, Department of Nephrology at uh, uh, KM uh, Mumbai. And uh, she is Associate Editor of Indian Journal of Nephrology. Uh, she has got many awards, many publications, and many leadership positions uh, to her credit. Uh, without wasting uh, much time, I'll invite Dr. Divya to please uh, uh, start your presentation and over to you now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Chawla. Thank you, Sridhar, sir, for making my job really, really easy. And I actually want to apologize. There has been a technical glitch the final slide set which i was wanted to share uh i can't share because my laptop it like my macbook it just stopped working suddenly just half an hour be before this presentation so what you what i'm presenting is a, a prior version of uh, my slides which are not beautiful but i'm i will try my best to uh, to uh, put forth the message across. Um, so uh, I want to keep it as interactive as possible. Uh, I, I will be very, uh, Sridhar sir's presentation was very lucid. It was like out of the world. Uh, mine will be more simple and I want to keep it more, um, more uh, practical uh, so that you have some uh, some few points which you can uh, take away to your uh, ward when you uh, go to your practice uh, tomorrow. So, uh, so electrolyte imbalances are multiple, like there are dis disbalances of sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus. I can go on and on, but I don't have much time. You also don't have much time. So what I have done is that I have chosen very few disorders which are specifically important for you people for your urology practice. So what are the disorders which you will see in urology? So for uh, so when I was preparing for this, I uh, I uh, uh, and, uh, envisioned four scenarios. And in those four scenarios, I am trying to put up majority of uh, electrolyte disorders. So first very common thing which uh, every urologist comes across uh, day in and day out is urinary tract obstruction. It can, be, uh, it can be because of calculus disease, it can be malignancy, it can be just a bladder outlet of obstruction, you are better uh, judge of what obstruction can be than me. So, but whenever there is an obstruction of urinary tract, there is a variety of changes which happens in the kidney physiology. And to sum up, these can be divided into two parts. First, it can be acute kidney injury driven when there is reduced GFR, patient is oligoanuric. Then we have metabolic acidosis, which is uh, very uh, nicely uh, taught to us by sir. Um, then which also comes with hyperkalemia and mostly the patient is in positive fluid balance. Another type of a disbalance which occurs, which is not very commonly appreciated, it is present in more patients, which is there in chronic obstructive uh, patients when they don't have a very 
uh, florid presentation, but almost every patient with obstruction has a particular type of renal tubular acidosis, which is the type 4 RTA, which is hyperkalemic. And it is because of the voltage gated channels, because of the increased pressure, there is a dysfunction in sodium potassium ATPase pump. So for urinary tract obstruction, I want you to remember these two things. And then you all are urologists. This is the uh, thing you, you do best. You relieve all the obstructions of our patients. So once you relieve the obstruction, the patient will go into diuresis. That is a good thing. We, ne we nephrologists are very, very happy when we see lots of urine pouring. But then it is not really good if it lasts for more than 48 hours. In such times, patient can develop another array of uh, electrolyte imbalances, which is uh, associated with hypokalemia, hyponatremia. Sometimes if we do not uh, resuscitate them well, they can even become hypernatremic when they become volume depleted. Most commonly, these people have metabolic alkalosis because of uh, contraction of uh, intravascular volume. They have hypomagnesemia, hypophosphatemia, sometimes hypocalcemia also. So this is another set of urinary uh, of electrolyte disba disbalance, which I am sure you will be seeing a lot in your cases when you relieve these obstructions. Third thing which I want you to uh, bring attention to is uh, this th sort of disorder, which are commonly seen with urinary intestinal diversions. As a nephrologist, these are the most difficult for me because the, uh, we nephrologists have a set uh, framework of how we think about potassium, chloride, sodium, acid base. And with urinary diversions, when you put uh, urinary uh, uh, stream to the intestine and then you take it out from there, every all our mathematics go haywire they can actually come with a wide array of various abnormalities and various uh, combinations. As you can see, it majorly depends upon which gut segment you people are using to do that diversion. As you can see, hypochloremia is common in all of them. So that is something which you should be looking for. When I say hypochloremia, I am thinking about chloride, which is less than 100. So sometimes these people have as low as 80, 70 uh, chloride. Then most of the disorder, apart from jejunum, jejunum is special. Actually, if you see stomach, ileum, colon, they are, almost go hand in hand. Jejunum is a little bit different. Uh, stomach, colon, ileum have hypokalemia with acidosis. Uh, Sridhar sir was talking about hyperkalemia and acidosis. Now, this is a rare thing where you have hypokalemia and acidosis. There are not many things in nephrology where you can have this combination. But this is a rare combination where you have hypokalemia and acidosis. Uh, however, in jejunum, we can have hyperkalemia with acidosis, which is more common. In jejunum, there is a, a definite increase in uh, RAS system and it gives rise to uh, hypertension and hyponatremia, which can be very profound, specifically in early stages. In lower parts of colon, there is hypocalcemia, which is common. So we will see most of them, uh, more of them if we have time later. Uh, as the disorders are different, their presentation can also be different. Uh, the uh, patients which are having uh, jejunal problems, as we saw, they have increased RAS, so that gives rise to dehydration and they come with nausea, vomiting and lethargy. Uh, patients with ileum and colon, they more so present with complaints of hypokalemia, which leads to fatigue, anorexia and weakness. And all of them are hypochloremic, so they have some weakness and lethargy. A patient with stomach come rise, give rise to seizures, which can, which is usually contributed by sodium imbalances. All of them can come with ventricular arrhythmias and muscle weakness. These are a very important group of patients. Sometimes it becomes difficult to diagnose. So whenever you come across these patients in your practice, do get a full panel of all the electrolytes done. Then this is another group which I thought of my urology colleagues do see, actually they refer them to me, uh, are those who are with stone disease. Like stone disease, it's so common in our country, but many a times we do not, uh, we are not able to go back and find out why the person has stone disease. So sometimes they just have stone disease because they are excreting more of calcium in their urine and they are having less of citrate in their urine. So there is a whole lot of uh, genetic and acquired disorders which are hypercalciuric disorders where there is more calcium in the urine 
there can be hypocalcemia with hypercalciuria when it is called familial hypocalcemic hypercalciuric syndromes it can be plain hypercalcemia plain hyperparathyroidism causing hypercalcemia and coming with stone disorders then whenever we get a, a patient with stone or nephrocalcinosis always always look at potassium and check abg many a times these people are hypokalemic when they are hypokalemic either they can have acidosis or they can have alkalosis if they have acidosis mostly it is distal renal tubular acidosis and if they have alkalosis it can be barter syndrome so whenever you think of you see these patients may, many of these disorders are subtle they don't they are not as florid as the urinary uh, diversion things they come with complaints of those disorders these disorders you have to look for them if you don't look for them you might miss them and you might miss an opportunity to treat the underlying cause which is causing nephrolithiasis or nephrocalcinosis in your patient so these were the four scenarios which i wanted you to keep in mind when you whenever you see uh, patients uh, with, who can have uh, who can have electrolyte imbalances there are many more but these are the four which i commonly feel my urology colleagues uh, come across more so let's uh, talk about some cases as i told my slide show was uh, lost so i made these slides in last uh, 15 minutes while uh, rajana sir was presenting so the case is not very well made so i'll tell you the case properly here so patient is actually a 75 year old lady she is a known case of cs cervix my hospital is across the road from tata memorial hospital like km and tata memorial are like just we are uh, we are neighbors so we get lots of these patients and most commonly the patient comes to us is referred from the oncologist because the creatinine is progressively rising it was 1.2 this lady was diabetic this is actually a case who's who was actually admitted uh, with me last week so diabetic elderly lady uh, admitted with cs cervix uh, undergoing uh, is planned for chemo uh, plus minus radio progressively rising creatinine there is hnhu uh, on uh, on ct usg uh, and uh, because the creatinine is rising patient is with us now and when we see the patient uh, she is already into established kidney failure output is dropping she is hardly past 10 ml in 5 hours and uh, the more problematic things are that she is in metabolic acidosis uh, her ph is 7.1 bicarb 10.4 pco2 i'll tell you is 24 which is the which now you have learned is compensated you just add 10 plus 15 and you get the compensation so that brings you around uh, 10 plus 15 to so around 24 25 but her potassium is 6.4 so now i want to know from you is what is which of these abnormalities is actually going to kill my patient anyone uh, i i don't know if you are allowed to type in the chat box or you can just unmute yourself we can make this interactive we can we can have options so which which so, of these uh, following is going to kill the patient uh, immediately like, it is it uh, is uh, 8 o'clock and you. patient might die at 9 o'clock yeah dr bajpay if i may interrupt you let them put it in the chat box because yeah. a lot of people speaking at the same time we are not going to have clarity exactly yeah at yeah that, that's a good presentation idea, yeah. you can run through the chat box and sum up what you think is yes. okay yeah thank you so actually uh, the correct answer is none of them will kill the patient in next one or two hours by 9 9:30 10 o'clock none of these things will kill because i already told that the i have not told that the patient is having creps in his tachypneic and is going to die of respiratory failure but this is the problem here this is the most ominous thing with this patient which i am really worried about so a patient who is oligoanuric with i am not worried about any potassium 6.4 i am a nephrologist i see potassium more than 6 daily i am not worried about them someone who is oligoanuric is in acute kidney injury with potassium 6.4 definitely i am worried about that so that brings us to uh, potassium dis disturbances potassium is mostly an intracellular cation this is very important for us to understand our body tries to keep the potassium hidden in the cells it doesn't like potassium swimming around in the uh, blood volume like in the fluid most of the potassium is trapped in the skeletal muscles it comes out whenever there is an injury to the skeletal muscle as you can see skeletal muscle is a is a huge organ it stores up to 75% of the uh, of the um, 
potassium as surgeons you must have uh, seen this also that whenever there's a crush injury there's rhabdomyolysis then again these people become hyperkalemic so this is an important point to remember that majority of potassium is in the cell in the skeletal muscle whenever there's a breakdown of any kind either the muscle is breaking or other cells are breaking patient can land up with uh, hyperkalemia now uh, what uh, defenses i have against Pro, uh, protecting me from hyperkalemia unfortunately it is only urine that's why whenever you see a patient with hyperkalemia first question to ask is what is the urine output if the output is bad you uh, that's an ominous sign you should be really worried about that patient uh, 10% is in stools uh, interestingly people who have end stage kidney disease they can excrete up to 20 to 30% in stool. That's a nature's mechanism to compensate for the loss of kidney function in their dietary, uh, uh, their, their intestinal excretion improves, increases. Hyperkalemia can have major, various, various causes. Uh, there can be lots of drugs, which we, which we usually give, which can cause hyperkalemia. It can be just a pseudo hyperkalemia, which is because of the, lots of breakdown. Uh, your intern has squeezed the, uh, arm very tightly, there's heparin, there, there can be various reasons, but there can be some real reasons like uh, care, decreased uh, kidney function. There can be reasons where there is a reduction in uh, aldosterone axis, hypoaldosteronism. I am not uh, very, uh, so it, most, most of these you will not, uh, uh, you will not see in your practice. What you will commonly see is AKI obstruction, which commonly comes with hyperkalemia. You will also see malignancies. Uh, which can come with tumor lysis syndrome and can cause hyperkalemia. Most of the acidosis disorders are uh, are uh, also accompanied by hyperkalemia. This is how hyperkalemia can kill you. Uh, so uh, it has direct cardiotoxicity, and uh, these are the these. This is uh, with the with seeing. So I, I'm married to a cardiologist, and we play this game. I share him ECGs, and he tells me. Or he shared me ECGs and I guess the level of potassium which the patient might be having. So that is another thing which is important to note that the toxicity of potassium is directly proportional to the level of potassium you have in your body. So uh, and it is also important to understand that potassium uh, toxicity is directly proportional to the rapidity of developing hyperkalemia. I have chronic kidney disease, end-stage disease patients. I have patients who are on dialysis who are chronically above six and they do not have any ECG changes. I do their ECGs in almost every dialysis clinic. They have no ECG changes because they have been used to that potassium. Their intracellular, extracellular potassium has equilibrated and everywhere the potassium is high. However, if my potassium was three today and they become six tomorrow, I do not have the time to equilibrate. And that's why my membrane becomes, uh, becomes very, um, very, very uh, active and it starts giving uh, rise to arrhythmias. So potassium worsening, either increasing or decreasing rapidly is actually the cause which can cause uh, arrhythmias. Also, whenever you have hyperkalemia with hypocalcemia, acidosis and hyponatremia, that is a dangerous triad. You, you, a patient who has acidosis, hypocalcemia and hyponatremia with hyperkalemia is very, very likely to have arrhythmias and can succumb to those. So whenever we have patient with hyperkalemia, we first of all look at what is it doing to us, uh, to the body, whether it is causing any muscle weakness, I have not covered that, but there is a entity known as hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. It is a channelopathy, which many people are born with. It can be acquired also. So it can cause, come with muscle paralysis, weakness. Uh, it can have, car or, or it can have cardiac conduction abnormalities. If bo any of the, uh, these are present, then you are dealing with a hyperkalemic emergency. You have absolutely no time. You are immediately supposed to push boluses of calcium gluconate to the patient and uh, prepare for either dialysis or any other uh, curative therapy which you are planning. If, however, these things are not there and your potassium is 6.5, uh, more than 6.5, if it is more than 6.5 and urine output is not there, again, I would consider it to be a hyperkalemic emergency and treat it like that. If potassium is less than 6.5,
but still if kidney function is impaired and this ongoing tissue breakdown this is very important crush injury tumor lysis rhabdo active catabolic state these people are going to have a rise in potassium anytime soon so again treat them as emergency if none of these things are there and potassium is just 5.8 5.5 creatinine is 1.5 and you can ecg is normal then you can just lower them slowly we will just discuss how to lower them slowly or lower them less promptly so just rem remember these uh, two uh, boxes which are the uh, danger signs of uh, treating hypo hyperkalemia hyperkalemia treatment is uh, involves three things first you protect the heart second you move the potassium in the cells and third you remove all the potassium from the body uh calcium gluconate is one of the most important drug uh, you can try this if you have not done this till now you see a patient with hyperkalemia he has tall t waves on the cardioscope and you sit in front of the patient and slowly push calcium gluconate immediately you will see the rhythm on the scope changing it is like magic it it works beautifully every time it is a cardioprotective drug it will uh, stabilize the myocyte membrane and decrease its excitability this is the dose i have given i have mentioned here this is how we give it over 3 minutes with ecg monitoring it can be repeated every uh, 10 minutes if it is it is not working or if the if uh, if the definite treatment is delayed and you should not mix it with bicarb and you should also uh, be cautious in people who are on digoxin because they can have hypercalcemia next treatment is insulin plus glucose so uh, calcium gluconate stabilize the membrane now we come to the second part we push all the uh, potassium available inside the cell and the way we do it is that uh, by using the properties of insulin along with glucose so that insulin actually does the work of pushing the uh, uh, the potassium inside the cell so you should need to give this potassium uh, this is commonly known as gi drip i am sure every one is uh, aware however if uh, if your um, uh, glucose is more than 250 then do not give dextrose because it is not going to work in a hyperglycemic patient give only insulin that is going to work and not a gi drip Uh, another drug which uh, very uh, nicely can put the potassium in the cell but is very short acting so it is one of the fastest acting but it is short acting the effect remains for a very short period of time you can give inhaled salbutamol inhaled uh, albuterol and also watch for tachycardia and tremor which is a known side effect of this drug now my favorite drug sodium bicarbonate my favorite it, it is not because i use it very often but i i am very dreaded of it i do not use it very often i want to tell you uh, what problems it can cause and that is why it is my favorite uh to this patient whether i want uh, someone to type in the chat if they can type uh, whether someone will give potassium uh, sodium bicarbonate to this patient his uh, his uh, uh, his uh, bicarb was 10 and ph was 7.0 if you want to uh, type you can type whether you will give uh, give this particular uh, drug to this patient so problem with potassium uh, with sodium bicarbonate is most important problem is that that it will cause a significant sodium and chloride overload it is even more it contains even more sodium chloride than 3% sodium chloride so that's why it can precipitate uh, metabol it can precipitate pulmonary edema and it is never to be given in someone who is oligoanuric and is already in, looks like to be in a uh, fluid overload uh, whenever we give uh, bicarb we try to give it in a isotonic infusion format where we i'll just tell how we make it isotonic bicarb uh, we always uh, try to give this to people who have a established urine output we avoid giving bicarb to an anuric patient we can give bolus of bicarb around uh, 1 to 2 meq per kg bolus but then again it will be there will be a risk of uh, pre uh, precipitating uh, hypernatremia and pulmonary uh, edema diuretics also work they will reduce potassium slowly they throw potassium out of the body this is the last uh, me mechanism of the uh, potassium clearance however it is important that do not use diuretic alone in treatment of hyperkalemia because these drugs are not fast 
they are not reliable they are slowly acting drug and they will not help you in a uh, life threatening situations most uh, the diuretic most helpful will be loop diuretics and also thiazide diuretic will be helpful uh, and they will uh, be able to you will be able to maintain uh, normokalemia once you have established it but with other means mineralocorticoids uh, is something which is uh, which has been uh, tried specifically in ty type 4 rta of diabetes can also be tried in type 4 rta of obstruction uh, we have given we have tried these in uh, patients who are on cni uh, calcineurin inhibitor transplant recipients because their mechanism of hyperkalemia is different so 0.1 uh, fludrocortisone we can increase it to 0.3 it also works uh, in a similar fashion and drives the potassium out of the body Cation uh, exchange resins, uh, something I never use because these are very slow acting drug, not very effective. I, I, I try to avoid, I'm used, I use it only, I'm pushed to the corner. Colonic necrosis is a real risk. I have seen one patient who uh, uh, had a very bad colonic necrosis. So uh, this, is, this is what I'm talking about, sodium polystyrene sulfonate, which commonly comes as K-bind powder. However, there are new potassium, uh, new cation exchange resins which are coming like patiromer uh, or ZS19, uh, uh, ZS9, which are definitely safer and better than k -bind. These are available in West. It are, they are also available uh, with some vendors in India. Patiromer is available. If it is available, this can be used in chronic patients where we want slow lowering of potassium. Finally, what we, I do... For that patient, um, the case one, I will uh, uh, I will immediately start the patient on a diuretic infusion, 40 milligram per hour. While that is, and I will push calcium gluconate as early as possible. This is only the time for me to arrange the dialysis kit, shift the patient to the dialysis room. By the time I do that, I will try to establish diuresis by uh, giving uh, diuretic and pushing calcium gluconate. I'll stabilize the membrane. And finally, a uh, aneuric patient, potassium 6.5, ECG changes, creatinine rising should be dialyzed. Hemodialysis is the modality of choice. Peritoneal dialysis removes potassium very, very slowly. So that is not something which I would be doing. There are various ways in which dialysis can remove potassium. I can improve the removal of potassium on dialysis by changing different things on dialysis, which I don't uh, think uh, thing will be important uh, to this audience. But dialysis can cause acute decrease in potassium. This is something for you people to remember whenever you send your patient for dialysis. Hyperkalemic patient comes back in the ward. The patient should be monitored very closely. We have lost patients because dialysis causes a sudden decrease in potassium. And as I said, rapid worsening of potassium, either increase or decrease, can cause membrane instability. So always try to uh, decrease the potassium slowly. And that's why we do not use zero potassium or one potassium dialysate. We always try to use two potassium dialysate. That, uh, that contains two millimole per liter. These are the uh, mechanic. These are the time of action. These are the faster ones, and this is the duration of action. It starts acting uh, in these minutes, and it remains for these minutes. So, as you see, insulin dextrose is the thing which remains for a long time and also starts in a pretty okay time. So, these two things we should be giving to all our patients while preparing them for dialysis and with diuretics if needed. Uh, I don't know how much time I have, but this is something important treatment of acute metabolic acidosis. As we saw, uh, correcting the underlying cause, treatment with alkali, bicarb and dialysis are the three ways in which we correct. Alkali is to be given only when it is really needed for acute kidney injury. We, it, is, uh, it is advised that whenever pH is less than 7.1, bicarb less than 15. And the goal is not to bring the pH and bicarb to normal. It is very important to understand that al metabolic acidosis is a very important survival mechanism. If you see the oxygen dissociation curve, because the tissue is getting hypoxic, it goes, it becomes acidotic and the oxygen is more dissipated. So we do not want a shock patient to become, no, to have a normal bicarb. We just want it to come up so that it doesn't harm the cardiac membrane and the heart uh, chronotropism and inotropism. So we just want to correct it to 7.2 uh, to 15. We do not want to overcorrect it. That will be harmful. 
so whenever a patient uh, and also pa patient with aki who does not have very severe acidosis avoid uh, giving alkali this is not ckd i'm talking about aki um the, something about bicarb uh, i'll skip this for the want of time bicarb how we calculate bicarb dose is uh, we uh, we check the base deficit which comes in the abg that is minus be we check that and once we see the base deficit we multiply that to the body weight into 0.5 for kids and for females and 0.6 for males 0.6 into total body weight is the total body water which is the volume of distribution of bicarb so just the base deficit into uh, into the total body water which will gives us the uh, a need of bicarb how much we want to give it desired bicarb uh, is a crude estimate you need to uh, recheck your bicarb and keep on uh, calculating uh, again and again with your uh, with your with the help of your repeated abgs do not give the whole deficit together give the deficit in parts we give first uh, half in the 4 hours and rest over 24 hours this is what is available in my hospital uh, in abroad they use this formulation but i have this if your hospital uses this then it will be different but this is what my hospital has so in this almost 1 ml is equal to 0.9 meq of bicarb so that is how we calculate so if my patient requires 90 meq bicarb i give uh, around uh, 90 ml of this uh, thing how i give it i almost always make it an isotonic solution so that my patient is not harmed this is how i make an isotonic solution i put 160 ml of 7.5% uh, sodium bicarb in 1 liter of d5 and whatever i get is 143 meq which is same as my serum sodium normally it is around 140 meq so that's why it becomes isotonic this is the safest way to give bicarb if your patient has urine output do not give bolus bicarbs make this solution and then you can give whatever amount you want you can start this amount at 100 ml per hour if the patient is passing 100 ml per hour 150 ml per hour if the patient is passing 150 ml per hour but always give isotonic bicarb because concentrated bicarb comes with a significant risk of volume overload sodium gain hypocalcemia hypokalemia overshoot alkalosis and hypercapnia so if you see each uh, each 10 ml contains 8.9 meq of sodium also not only bicarb which is much more than what uh, bicarb is present in 3% nacl 3% nacl has just 5 meq per 10 ml and this is 8.9 meq so you are giving double you are giving 6% nacl so think about that and then only give it in lactic acidosis which you will very commonly see there is hardly any role of bicarbonate therapy the only thing which helps lactic acidosis is treating the underlying cause anticipate the risks of giving bicarb before giving bicarb people who are obstructive airway disease who are hypokalemic hypocalcemic avoid giving bicarb directly to them and also those who are hypernatremic uh whenever we give uh, bicarb we avoid mixing them with inotropes and we avoid mixing them with iv calcium because it can precipitate obviously and we give them as uh, not as bolus and uh, give as infusions once the C uh, ph rises above 7.2 bicarb should uh, not be increased by more than 4 to 8 to avoid the risk of therapy and give the bolus only if you are giving bolus if you are pushed to the corner your patient doesn't have output dialysis is giving de getting delayed you want to give bolus give maximum bolus of 1 to 2 meq per kg so for a 60 uh, kg man do not give more than 120 meq dk i will skip for the uh, want of therapy this is uh, for dialysis i will skip that for chronic patients we treat them with this uh, wonderful drug it is sodium bicarbonate oral sodium bicarbonate we start Uh, we have formulas for calculating doses but then uh, uh, when we started we see that they are inadequate and we keep on stepping them up to bring the bicarb up to 24 ckd are different from aki ckd bicarb we want 24 aki bicarb we want above uh, 50 so now you are a urologist you have removed the obstruction now the patient uh, has uh, developed the post obstructive diuresis now what do you do so post obstructive diuresis the definition is here once the initial amount of urine is drained if someone is passing more than 200 ml per hour for at least two consecutive hours or if the complete urine output over 24 hours is 3 liter above it is diagnosed as post obstructive diuresis 
for first 24 to 48 hours it is physiological it is because of sodium water which is retained in the body for so long it has to come out so the so body just throws it out however after 48 hours if it continues and if urine osmolarity is high then it is definitely pathological that is because of the damage which has happened because of obstruction to the renal tubular channels now mainly uh, proximal tubular channels so any diuresis lasting more than 48 hours with a high urine osmolarity is pathologic which fluid you will use for resuscitating these people who have post obstructive diuresis whether you will give ns rl uh, d5 half ns so uh, this is a very very important chart all of you must uh, keep a copy of this also along with the with those things which uh, shrijana sir has told us uh, if you see, uh, so normal saline is not normal. It is very abnormal. It has 154 MEQ of potassium of sodium and 154 MEQ of chloride. So it is not uh, normal. Uh, normal uh, is something which is as close to uh, our serum sodium. So which 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 will be around around either RL or half NS. Or now we have these uh, balanced uh, solutions, which are also good if the patient can afford. I, we prefer uh, isolite uh, M. So in the initial first two to four hours, we resuscitate with NS. We give 100% of whatever the patient is diuresing. If output is coming at 200 ml per hour, we give 200 ml per hour. However, the problem is that if you keep on giving it, body will keep on throwing it. So the diuresis will persist. It will never stop. So after four hours, once the uvolemia is established, then you give only 75% of what the urine output is coming. So if your urine output is 100 ml, you give 75 ml. And do not give sodium because sodium, uh, do not give NS because NS has an excessive sodium load. See, if you keep on giving sodium to kidneys, sodium to remove that sodium, kidney will bring water. And to bring out that water, it, the diuresis will continue. And then the patient will finally become hypovolemic. So the trick here is to give a fluid which has which can resuscitate also, not allow hypovolemia, and which will not precipitate diuresis. And that fluid is 0.5% normal saline. A post-obstructive AKI recovering kidney cannot handle sodium. It will only handle, uh, cannot handle NACL, it will handle 0.5% and only give half normal saline uh, for replacement and that to give only for 75% uh, of the, 75% um, of whatever the patient is passing. Uh, vital signs need to be very closely monitored. These people go into intravascular depletion very soon, specifically elderly people. Uh, they have a, this higher tendency of going into intravascular depletion with a, even with a small uh, diuresis. Uh, you check urine output every two hourly to make sure that uh, you are on the correct path. These people become hypokalemic, hypophosphatemic and hypomagnesemic quickly. So do cardiac monitoring and at least 12 hourly get their labs. Uh, uh, Arun sir, uh, do we have time or are we shooting time? Uh, we like have wind up. We have to wind up because Dr. Ainman yeah. has to give it and then we have to wind up. 8.30 we need to give another meeting follows after that. Yeah. What I'll yeah. do is that I, maybe I can share my actual slides with all the yeah. uh, residents on all the yeah. everyone so that you can, they can. You can just put into that uh, WhatsApp group. I'll hand over to them. No problem. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We'll do that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Mohan? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Bajpai. Uh, I wish you had the time that you desired and the presentation. Maybe there will be another occasion. A few things to sum up, especially for urologists. First, let us bless the nephrologists and the intensivists and the residents because all these complicated things, they're around to take care and we don't really have to worry too much beyond maybe the first few minutes. I would like to draw attention to one aspect of urologic practice and that is pain. Pain is an important cause of hyperventilation. And <clears throat> we've seen from both presentations that hyperventilation results in acidosis. And therefore, controlling pain is important for maintaining acid-base balance. We heard from Dr. Bajpay about the gut. Important to remember with respect to gut is the hyperchloremia 
and therefore calculating anion gap becomes a bit tricky where people have diversion into bowel segments. The third point that I would like to make, which Dr. Bajpayee also made, is using potassium exchange resins for treating hyperkalemia. We heard 30% is excreted in renal failure through the colon. If we give them potassium exchange resins, they develop constipation and this exchange doesn't take place. Therefore, though it used to be very fanciful to use this, we'll have to adopt different strategies. And finally, why do we need to know all this as urologists? We need to know all this as urologists because acute management of every patient is in our hands. The nephrologists, the intensivists, and the cardiologists are all going to come in, maybe an hour later, two hours later, three hours later. What to do, what not to do is important. Calcium gluconate undoubtedly is a wonderful drug, but don't do it in the general ward by the bedside unless you have a cardiac monitor running at the same time. With this, I would like to end my comments and uh, thank you both for your presentations. I'm sure we'll have other occasions to deal with similar issues in future. Over to you, Dr. Arun Chawla. Yeah, so on behalf of Indian School of Urology, USA, uh, many thanks to Dr. Rajana Sridhar and Dr. Divya and Dr. to Dr. Mohan also, <coughs> who has taken uh, a lot of uh, efforts to summarize and uh, what a urology resident should be knowing about the uh, acid base and the electrode imbalance. Uh, I will request <clears throat> Dr. Divya if he can hand over the slides so that I can put in the group. Dr. Rajana's slide I have already put in the uh, this chat box, but still I will circulate to that. And I request the residents, uh, those who have missed, please, uh, this will be uh, in the YouTube tomorrow in the USA archives. Um, if you are, you know, we know that exams are starting, theory exam is starting next week or in some universities a little later. Uh, make sure that you revise this webinar again. You will have so much wealth of information is there. What you read in Campbell, it will take three, four days. What you see in this is 70 minutes, 75 minutes with carry home messages, you can easily revise very quickly. And there are so many examples both the faculty have given. And uh, that probably will make the subject understanding so simple. With this, again, again, I thank uh, Dr. Divya, Dr. Rajana, and Dr. Hey Mohan. And if there is any question in the chat box, I request you to take. Uh, otherwise, we'll sign off. One minute. Let me have a look. Yeah. There were only responses on hyperkalemia, about hyperkalemia being the immediate killer. Uh, otherwise, there are no questions in the chat yeah. box. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll sign off. Good night. Yes. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Good night everybody.